the 2019 winner, Joe Burrow, Louisiana State University. Auburn wins the BCS National Championship. looking at beautiful Bristol, Connecticut, where we are every single week right here on Friday at 8 p.m. And I've been counting down completely wrong. I don't know what date I've been counting down to, but it's actually 46 days until the Heisman Trophy ceremony. Welcome to the Heisman Show presented by Nissan, premier partner of the Heisman Trophy. I'm Christine Williamson, and Jason Fitz is in the building today. We got to talk about that very <laughs> soon. But first, lucky for Harry Lyles, who's in Atlanta, we have another guy that admires his looks because last week we talked about it. My mom's into them, Trevor Maddich is into them, and Jason Fitz was complimenting them earlier. So Harry Lyles is back. I, to bless I, everybody with this. No, I still I have a theory here. Like <laughs> it's so perfectly cut. My theory is that Harry Axon doesn't have hair. It sits by the bed and he just <laughs> pops, pops it on. It, that, that's the way he starts the nice day. Nice and neat. Well, we have a theory about you, Fitz, and it's okay. that you possibly live here because you have been on pretty much every digital show, at least this week, uh, except for, I don't know, you weren't on the draft show. That's pretty much it. And you've been on every single show. show yeah. Well, you do. A, I mean, we do a ton of work together. You're right, though. The college football spectrum is a, it's a busy one, as you can see here. Yeah, Countdown to game graphic. day, we do. And. Uh, Monday tailgate, I get the opportunity to hang out and do some NFL. And uh, I should also, at this point, so Sarah Spain doesn't yell at me, remind everybody, Spain and Fitz, ESPN Radio, <laughs> 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. So, you know, it, it's good to be busy. It, the college sports uh, spectrum's out there. I'm just glad you let me keep hanging out with you, Christine. Yeah, of course. I mean, we hang out almost every single day. It's great. Um, so. <laughs> I, that, that didn't feel genuine. No, like, that, it's really great. I mean, it's great. <laughs> You know, Harry, it's 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 great. It's, it's great. It's good. It's great. Um, Don't but make I do me come up there, guys. <laughs> I do want to talk about something because we're also in a uh, group chat, and Michael Jr. is in that group chat. He sent us a beautiful picture of a man who should be the picture of college football. This is from the Maine Black Bears. It's such a glorious photo. Gojo actually shared this this photo on his Twitter account and said that we should make this a statue. Right. And I mean, I think it'd be a pretty solid statue. I don't know exactly how they would do that. I don't know how they make statues, but I feel like that'd be a hard statue to make. Maybe it should not be a statue. Maybe it should be a trophy. But I would say, are we <laughs> sure that's not Mike? <laughs> I mean, wow. I can't confirm that's not Mike. Wow, I, I don't think he's watching tonight because we believe that he's celebrating his friend's birthday, but I feel like that would be kind of insulting. But this is what the statue would look like. Now, that's hot. That's awesome. So, I mean, it looks pretty good. Is it gold? I think, it, yeah, I think it's probably a gold statue. It's a statue. A gold of course statue. it's gold. Nobody wants a... a there's other things that statues can be made of. I guess they have bronze. Yeah, or, that's yeah. a heavy statue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Harry's thinking about weight right now. But you, if you're big yeah. enough to get that statue, you ain't worried about the weight of it. It's also like, what right. would you be winning if you got the statue? But it made us think about some other possible trophies that you could get. And we haven't seen these photos, so we're just going to be reacting to other trophies that you can get. Oh, oh these just are other great, great oh, college my God. football photos. That's a good one. Oh, that's I a mean, really good one. I love that. I mean, I don't know if it's like a happy one. I think, though, like there's just a basic level of respect you ask somebody for you before you pet their dog. So, like, did Whitlow actually, like, check in with somebody uh -huh. before he went over there and interacted with Bully? I don't know. Clearly not, because <laughs> Bully does not look happy. Mm, no. All right, next one. Oh, yeah. Everybody loves a good Gatorade shower. <laughs> That's that's like the perfect one. Most of the time, you're usually like on the side or you know getting like drip, like a drip of Gatorade. Do that's you like see a like whole... the like the roundness, the yeah. halo? That by the way, I keep encouraging us after one good show to do the Gatorade dunk. Like I think it'd be a spectacular content. Although I'm who's, not who's getting dunked. Well, I mean, in we this situation, dunk, well, no, we'll dunk Kenny because he's the producer. He's the one that put this thing together. Well, that's fair, but then there's a <laughs> lot of control room buttons around there. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And Harry also, I'm not sure like Harry Lyles would feel like we just talked about the perfect quaff. You cannot dunk the perfect quaff <laughs> like that. That's gonna mess that whole game up for a long time. <laughs> All right, let's look at number three. Oh yeah, Reggie Bush. That's just the classic. Mm -hmm. Harry, Harry, I know you used no, to play football back in the day. 
You weren't a running uh, back, uh, but, you play, know. Play is a word for it. <laughs> I, I guess you could say that. But I did a whole lot more watching both at home on TV and on the sidelines. But uh, that looks like something that I wish I could do. Oh, okay. I was going to say, could you do that? Kind of feels no, like not quite. <laughs> it's like next week's Thanksgiving feels like they're doing the wishbone with his legs. They're just like, <laughs> wow, that's painful. That's what it looks like. Yeah, that's that would painful. Hurt. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Whatever. Uh, you, you miss, you missed it. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say the hand motion that that Fitz did there is, it just, just sounds very painful. <laughs> um, but we took that picture from main practice because they are not playing until the spring, so they're only practicing. And there are some other people that did not practice, that did not play. This past week, a lot of Heisman hopefuls. Uh, Trevor Lawrence and Travis Etienne were on a bye. Zach Wilson was also on a bye. Mac Jones, Najee Harris, and Devontae Smith did not play versus LSU. That game was postponed. And a game that was canceled, Justin Fields in Ohio State versus Maryland. But here's a guy that did play. Kyle Trask. And I feel like this is happening, right? We see a lot of COVID postponements or cancellations. And then another guy steps up. This week, it was Kyle Trask in Florida. He obliterated Arkansas in Florida's 63-35 win, went 23 for 29 for 356 yards and six passing touchdowns. He became the first player in Florida history to throw six passing touchdowns in multiple games in a season, and he now has 28 passing touchdowns on the season, tied with Graham Harrell for the most in a team's first six games in the last 20 seasons. All of that has Trask now sitting at number one in the ESPN.com Heisman Watch. And um, I don't know, Harry, I'll ask you this because I know you, you participate in the ESPN.com Heisman Watch list. Is Kyle Trask truly number one? I mean, I voted him number one this week just because I, I feel like at some point, you know, we kind of have to start evaluating this thing, you know, like it's a regular season, even though it's not. And, you know, the other thing with this, too, is that even in a regular year, the Heisman is absolutely something that we take on a week by week basis. And if you're Kyle Trask and you throw for over 350 yards and six touchdowns and we haven't seen Trevor Lawrence in three weeks and Mac Jones in two and Justin Fields has still only played, I think, four games. You know, we have to give him that type of consideration. And I mean, he's putting up numbers, uh, you know, very similar to a guy that we saw last year. So we're going to take a video game conversation here, Harry. Let's say <laughs> that we brought back NCAA, right? And we have NCAA brought together. And all of a sudden we go in franchise mode where, but it's fantasy mode. And you can pick any one player right now in college football today to build your team around. You really want to tell me that you would take Kyle Trask as your one game off the video game. He's your first name off the board and it's not Trevor Lawrence. No, he's not my first. It's absolutely either Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields. But at the same time, again, with this award, it obviously has not gone to the best player in college football the past, I would say, two decades because mm -hmm. I think we'd have more defensive winners and we would have more wide receiver and running back winners. So for the sake of how I think this award is going to go, he should be number one at this point. I don't think he'll necessarily win it in the end. Uh, but to answer your question, I, I personally would like to go with Justin Fields. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and guys, I think as much as we're talking about, you know, Kyle Trask and the fact that he's leading right now, I still think that there's so much runway left, especially, and I, I use Trevor Lawrence's name, but mm -hmm. let's be real. I mean, Clemson loses, although it was not Uyunga Lele's fault that they lost that game. Uh, Clemson loses to Notre Dame. They're going to get the opportunity to run that back. And when they run that back, if it has a different result, that's only going to suddenly bring the street cred up, in my mind, for Trevor Lawrence. He's going to get more of a pop for doing what he's done so consistently. I feel like Trevor Lawrence at this point is the same. He's a victim of the same thing that Mahomes is in the NFL and, and LeBron is in the NBA. Like, they just be the NBA, the MVP every year because they're better and we get bored with it. So, yeah. Kyle Trask is doing what we didn't expect Kyle Trask to do. So, that becomes the shiny new Joe Burrow toy. Well, yeah, I was going to say, a lot of comparisons are being made between Kyle Trask and Joe Burrow, and his numbers are really comparable. So, like you said, is this really just – is it Trevor Lawrence needs to set up or is it step up or is it Kyle Trask Heisman to lose? Well, I think that uh, I don't think it's Kyle Trask Heisman to lose. A couple of reasons. Kyle Trask is still going to have to take on Alabama. So, you know, uh, yes, in theory, he could he could win that game. Fine. But even through that process, I, I believe that Trevor Lawrence has enough runway 
left to get there, uh, like I said, with the win over Notre Dame. But the other side of it is I'm not willing to rule out Justin Fields either. And, yeah. you know, the only problem that I think Justin Fields has realistically at this point is there aren't a lot of great teams in the Big Ten. So at some point, he will become victim of the same conversation so many quarterbacks have in the past. Are the stats padded because of the level of opponent? I mean, the fact that we just don't see great football teams and the, team, the teams in the Big Ten that are great, I'm not sure, are getting as much love and belief as most great teams do. So uh, I think that Justin Fields should still have the opportunity. I just don't know that I can find the path as easily. And I certainly feel like when players start playing again, because we haven't seen so many players playing in the last couple of weeks, that we'll certainly see a little things, a, a couple of things change, change as well. But let's talk about a few dark horse candidates because there were some people that played last weekend that are going to get some love this week too, since we only saw a few guys play last week. And we'll start with the U. <laughs> If you can't see this, but Fitz is over here shrugging his shoulders. Harry, does this happen every week where she takes her to the fire? Every week, baby. Every Derek week. Derek continues to ball out for my University my Harry, Miami Hurricanes, throwing for 24 for 38. 255 yards and a touchdown and number nine Miami's nail-biting 25-24 win over Virginia Tech and adding another score on the ground. But – this is the thing. We're talking about how players, when they don't play, don't get any love. Unfortunately, he's starting to build momentum, but Miami came down with COVID cases, and they have their next two games rescheduled, so this is what their new schedule looks like. But here's something that's very interesting to look at. The December 19th game is also the day of the ACC championship. Miami currently is third in the ACC. Top two, top two teams play in the championship game. So unless Clemson or Notre Dame fall back, that game on December 19th versus Georgia Tech will go on as scheduled. If either team loses and Miami then has, then Miami has a shot at the championship game, we'll have some serious juggling to do. And, I mean, Harry, we've talked about this since literal day one. You brought this up before this show even started. Postponements, cancellations are really going to affect this Heisman race. So how do you feel like this, this kind of propels, does this take Derek King out of the conversation? I think it does. Uh, and, you know, it's weird because those things were working in his favor, right? Like we didn't see Trevor Lawrence. Uh, you know, we haven't seen Mac Jones. And so he had his opportunity, right? And But the thing with him is you have to be a little bit more consistent. You can't throw for five touchdowns one week and then show up the next week against Virginia Tech and throw one. Uh, you know, so like it's unfortunate and you kind of explain it there when you say he's probably going to be playing, you know, against Georgia Tech uh, the night of the ACC championship. That's just not a recipe for success there. Yeah, Harry, I think you make a really good point. Also, you know, I think we're going to hear this hype go, but the consistency is going to matter to voters because when you look at that schedule you pulled up earlier, Wake Forest, we all know, doesn't have a great defense, and North Carolina was supposed to be a better team, but their defense has failed them consistently. Those two games are going to be shootouts, so he's going to have the opportunity to pad big numbers. The problem is I think he uh, he's taken himself out of consideration with some of his own games so yeah. far this season. So while I think that the postponements play a part of it, I, I think his own play – in a couple of games is going to be the difference that keeps him out of it. Christy, so you, we go over this all the oh time. Oh, God. You're a Clemson fan and a Miami fan and a Big 12 fan because yeah. we have ties to all three places. Yeah. So I'll just ask you, I mean, in this Heisman conversation, if we get to the Heisman final uh -huh. and you've got Trevor Lawrence and De'Ara King both nominated, uh, both uh, sitting there in Bristol because for the first time <laughs> yeah, ever yeah. it'll come yeah, from yeah. here, who are you rooting for? Okay, I'm going to say I have to root for T-Law because T-Law has been holding it down at Clemson for a while now. De'Ara King just – just arrived to Miami. And, you know, I am a Miami fan. I love when they get good players on their team, but I don't really know Derek King like that. I'm just glad he's given Miami a little boost. You feel me? Yeah, no, no. I just wanted to figure <laughs> out where those loyalties lied uh, this early, this early. One other quarterback we haven't mentioned yet uh, that we should mention is Ian Book. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I, I want your thought. Like, Harry, where are you on Ian Book? All he did was go in and beat Clemson. Come on. So, should we be giving him more love? Okay, so here is my thought process on Ian Book, right? And I'm going to use a little metaphor here. Uh, he should be allowed in the club, right? Because Ian Book's <laughs> got on all the right clothes, right? He plays for Notre Dame and everything like that. But once he gets in the club, right, and we're talking about him in Heisman consideration, he's not getting a VIP booth. He's not getting bottle service because you got to have a few more touchdowns and yards to, you know, get those kinds of things. So 
you know, we can let him in the club, but he, you know, he's not, he's not popping bottles. I'm sorry. I, I do love the way we just showed that highlight reel, which looks great, but we left out the fumble that almost cost him the game. And I realized it was an almost, but I'll, I'll double down on what Harry's saying there too. Like uh, in, on the NFL side, yeah. I was talking to one person about a quarterback in the NFL and, and he said, Hey, if you really want an analysis on it, think about the other sideline. Are they sitting there when they have a two touchdown lead saying, Oh my God, we're never going to be able to hold up because they have him at quarterback. Is anybody going to look at Notre Dame if they're up by 21 and say oh my god how can we ever beat them because yeah. we have e- they have Ian Book yeah, I yeah, mean so true. I mean that's just that's a missing part of the component to me yeah so with all that being said here are the current Heisman odds from Caesars Mac Jones and Justin Fields are both tied at the top Trevor Lawrence sits behind them and Kyle Trask has the fourth best odds We now welcome in our college football analyst, Heather Dinich. And Heather, we like to bring you in so you can help us make sense of all of the chaos that's going on in college football. So the Heisman Trust released its 2020 schedule last weekend. The voting deadline is now on December 21st after conference championship games on December 19th. Same relative timeline as before. The finalists will be revealed on December 24th at 7.30 p.m. on ESPN. And then the ceremony is January 5th, 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. That's after both semifinals, which are slated for New Year's Day. And, you know, we now know the Heisman schedule. A lot of guys that are Heisman hopefuls will hopefully be in the CFP. We understand there's been some news coming out this past week. So what is the latest? So the 10 FBS commissioners and Notre Dame Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick, who comprised the CFP Management Committee, they met this week and they decided that they're going to keep the playoff on track with the hopes of naming that national champion on January 11th in Miami Gardens, keeping the semifinals on January 1st, the Rose and Sugar Bowl this year are hosting. But the interesting note that came out of that meeting this week was that they are not going to name a replacement team should one of those semifinalists experience a COVID situation that would prevent them from playing on January 1st. In other words, the committee isn't going to say, okay, we're going to bump up that number five team so that they can play. So that opens up a whole other can of worms as to what do you do then? And they don't have the answer to that right now. But uh, Heather, let's stay there for a second. I mean, at this point, and I heard uh, Bill Hancock on Freddie and Fitzsimmons this week on ESPN Radio, and they asked about the possibility of postponement should there need to be to to fulfill this. And he said that that's not something set in stone either. So they're not going to bump a team in. They're not going to postpone. I mean, at some point, don't they have to have a contingency plan of some sort? Well, those two things do go hand in hand, right? Because let's say that one of those semifinalists has an outbreak, and clearly we're seeing now that it's not just one week, it's two weeks. If you're talking about Texas A&M or Wisconsin, right? So as soon as you bump that back even one week, you start to get into the NFL playoffs. Now, can you get creative and play a semifinal on a day that's not a college football Saturday? Sure, but it would take some maneuvering, right? And then the further you bump that back, You're looking at January 30th as the next open Saturday, and that's the Saturday that's in between the NFL playoffs and the Super Bowl. So what do you do? That's when you're talking about pushing the playoff back, which is exactly what they are trying to avoid. So speaking of creativity, Heather, uh, there was a conversation, obviously, about the Pac-12 and the fact that they're now opening up to possibly scheduling out-of-conference opponents. When I talked to Pollock today on College Football Live, he, he's of the opinion that Oregon and BYU both desperately need to play each other for the college football playoff committee. But wouldn't that also help Zach Wilson, who's trying to make some sort of a Heisman run as well? It sure would. I mean, look, when you're talking about BYU and Cincinnati as the two teams that are outside of the Power Five conferences with a chance to get into this conversation, what's their ceiling? We need to see more from BYU. Cincinnati might be okay. They, If they run the table and they win the American Athletic Conference Championship, they have a chance, right? BYU and Oregon, that would help both of those 
teams, to be quite honest, because if you're looking at the Pac-12 right now and you have USC and Oregon, you know, they look good. They're not great. This would be an opportunity for both of them. And then Zach Wilson can really make a statement against a talented Oregon team or USC, whoever it might be. So it's important because the more opportunities you have as a team or as a player to impress either the selection committee or the voters, the Heisman voters, that all matters in the end. So you mentioned how the more opportunities they have to play, obviously, is better for them, for Heisman hopefuls. As a Heisman voter, how are you looking at the schedule changes? Because even like when you look at Trevor Lawrence, right, he was leading the Heisman camp, the Heisman race, and then he missed two games, and all of a sudden he's behind two other guys. So like, how much does that impact you as a voter? Guys, I can tell you, as we sit here today, I am going to agonize over this in December. <laughs> These are the kinds of debates that I fight with myself in my head over all the time. And yet, look, Trevor Lawrence dropped because he didn't play two games. Is that fair? I don't know. Maybe maybe not. I, he didn't get worse. He's still one of the best players in the country. I think what I'm going to do at the end of the day is the same thing the selection committee is going to do with these teams. How did you perform against top 25 competition, against teams with winning records in the toughest games? What did you mean to your team? Um, all of those different things go into the conversation. Were you in a playoff? Were you in a, um, a conference championship game? I mean, you, you see what Kyle Trask did this past weekend and it's jaw dropping. Can anyone sustain that from week to week or is there somebody who's inconsistent? So there are so many factors that go into it guys and I have a hard enough time at the end of Saturday nights trying to do this for ESPN.com. <laughs> Heather, I got to ask you real quick. I always think this is interesting when you talk to somebody with a Heisman vote. Like, for me, with the Grammy vote, I'm really I'm, – I'm quiet about it. I, I, I want to be sort of to myself. I know some people that talk to each other a lot. For your process, are you more introverted or extroverted as you try and figure it out? I, I'm more introverted about it. Like I said, it's arguments with myself. Um, but I – when I'm asked about it, I'll certainly talk about it. But I won't talk about it – as the actual voting unfolds, obviously, that particular week, I just keep my mouth shut about it until the finalists are announced, and then we'll see what happens. But I think they're great conversations to have, and I think that by having the conversations, you learn more about it, just like the selection committee does sitting around the table. And it's interesting to hear other people's opinions, especially our analysts and Trevor Maddich. Like, what do these guys think about Zach Wilson? They think he's the real deal. And when I hear them talk about things like that, that matters and influences the way I think about him as well. Well, I'm not sure if that makes it easier or harder, but hopefully for your sake, a little bit easier, especially with this crazy, crazy 2020 college football season. So uh, good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heather. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, guys. Thanks. It's the first ever one versus two collision in this rivalry to the winner of the BCS championship game in Glendale, Arizona. Wide open. Forward into the end zone. Touchdown, Michigan. Michael Hart. In zone. Got it. Ohio State will play for a national championship. The Buckeyes beat their arch rival again. All right, believe it or not, it is November 20th, and around this time, teams are usually getting ready for their Thanksgiving rivalry games. It's one of the biggest uh, things that we look forward to in the college football season and one of the biggest rivalry games on that day, Michigan versus Ohio State. But for the first time, the big game will not be played until December because, you know, it's 2020. Regardless, there have been epic moments in that rivalry, and we're going to take a look at one now that had some big implica implications for the Heisman. This was in the piece leading into the segment. In 2006, Michigan and Ohio State faced off while being ranked first and second, respectively, for the first time ever, and it did not disappoint. Troy Smith threw for 416 yards and four touchdowns, with solidified, which solidified his Heisman Trophy campaign. Harry, I'm going to ask you this one because we haven't heard from you in a minute. What do you remember about this game? I just remember a lot of the conversation about that game being like, okay, no matter like who wins or loses, we should probably just do this rematch for the BCS title game. And for myself, I believe I was a freshman in high school at that time. And I remember telling everybody at school and, you know, I'm from Atlanta, so it's just nothing but SEC fans around here. 
that Ohio State was going to kill Florida, and Florida ended up dog walking Ohio State. <laughs> Fitz, do you remember anything about no, that game? No, 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 no. I mean, that, that's a killer story. I can't top that anyway. <laughs> All right, so now let's go this weekend to, in 1997, a little bit further back. Uh, Charles Woodson returned a punt for a touchdown against Ohio State as the top-ranked Wolverines beat the number four Buckeyes 20-14. to 14. Michigan was later declared national champions by the AP, and Woodson went on to win the Heisman Trophy, and 23 years later, he still – is the only defensive player to ever win this award. Fitz, I'll ask you, what the heck is it going to take for another defensive player to win the Heisman? Well, first I'm going to tell you Charles Woodson's story because I feel like it because uh, okay. I'm the old guy in the room. Uh, so I had just moved to Nashville, Tennessee, when this this era was happening. And, you know, I didn't come from an, er- an, an area where college football resonated with everybody, right? So uh, I moved to Nashville. Everybody's freaking out over Peyton Manning. I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll see what's going on here. It's fine. I walked into a bar the first day that I walked in. I was wearing the wrong colors. I got beer thrown all over me. But eventually, <laughs> that after this, Charles Woodson drafted by my beloved Raiders. Uh-huh. Anybody that watches me on ESPN knows I don't hide my Raiders fandom. So I immediately get all this Woodson gear, and I walk in. I'm not thinking anything of it. I'm just like, yeah, he's drafted by the Raiders. Of course I'm a Charles Woodson fan. My friends in Nashville were so livid with me because Charles Woodson, according to them, stole the Heisman from Peyton Manning. And I'm telling you, to this day, there is anger in and around Vol country over the fact that Charles Woodson won the Heisman that they think Peyton Manning oh so much deserves. So I always love to troll so him a little were, bit. Uh, so you were doing that on purpose? No, no, I didn't know. Oh, okay. but not then, but now. Okay, yeah, okay. Absolutely. now you do it on purpose. Well, yeah. uh, well, I'll ask you this then, Harry, because I know that you're all about guys that aren't quarterbacks <laughs> possibly getting in this Heisman conversation. What do you think? How will another defensive player possibly win the Heisman? I mean, this probably would have been a really great year for it, right? Because you've got these postponements. And if you would have had somebody like an Indomitian Sue or a Jadavion Clowney who was playing right now, had a nice slate of eight games where they just played out of their mind, and you've got these quarterbacks who have played four or five or six games, then maybe like that's the opportunity. But I think it has to happen down the line because we have to start having a conversation about this being the actual most outstanding player award and not the best quarterback award. All right. Well, no Michigan, Ohio State this weekend. That's not until December 12th. But here are the games that are happening this weekend involving Heisman contenders. First, we got number three, Ohio State versus number nine, Indiana. Of course, Justin Fields plays for Ohio State. He'll be kicking off with that. Number four, Clemson at Florida State. Trevor Lawrence back and virus free for his first game since October 24th. That's a long time. And of course, Travis Etienne will be in that game. Also, number six, Florida at Vanderbilt. Kyle Trask will be in that one. And Kyle Pitts, of course. <laughs> Shout out to Harry. Number eight, BYU versus <laughs> North Alabama. Zach Wilson will be playing in that one. Number one, Alabama versus Kentucky. Mac Jones, Najee Harris, and Devontae Smith will be in that one. So uh, I'm going to go with this question. What does Indiana need to do <laughs> this weekend I mean, to get a win? <laughs> in theory, Indiana gets their wins, Harry, by forcing turnovers. They have at least two in every game. The problem is Justin Fields, as we all know, doesn't have any. He has as many incompletions as he has touchdown passes. He only had one interception last year. So, Harry, when I look at this, it's the problem is what Indiana needs to do to win is the one thing that Ohio doesn't do, and that's turn over the football. Yeah, and, you know, I talked to uh, Indiana head coach Tom Allen a couple of weeks ago, and I was asking him, like, hey, like, what about your team to surprise you this year? And he's like, well, the one thing that we knew that we were going to do well is play defense. And, you know, when you're playing against a player like Justin Fields, you you cannot stop him, right? You can only hope to contain him. So, you know, if the Indiana defense is able to just kind of, you know, keep the clamps on him just a little bit uh, and then hope that obviously Michael Penix Jr. comes through with one of his better games uh, that we've seen this year, a more consistent game uh, is the way that Allen had described it to me. I think that's going to be their best shot, but it's going to take a lot of uh, shooting themselves in the foot by Ohio State, possibly for this one to come through. All right, so we got three guys at the top. Kyle Trask, Mac Jones, Trevor Lawrence, right? Which guy, it doesn't have to be one of those three, do you think has to impress the most on Saturday? Harry, I'll start with you. I think it's got to be Trevor Lawrence, and not necessarily because, you know, he's fallen so far behind or anything like that, but he doesn't have another signature game coming up outside of that ACC championship. And if you look at the schedule, I mean, Florida State, I don't know if you guys have uh, seen what's going on down there. Things do not look great. Uh, (laughs) Even their best defensive player, Marvin Wilson, is out for the year with an injury. So, listen, this is one of those games where Trevor Lawrence, like, hey, man, we know that you have been, you know, the ideal top pick in the NFL draft for the past few years. 
go out here and throw five or six touchdowns on that Florida State defense. I'm going to go with a slightly different answer, sticking with the quarterbacks. I'm actually going to go with Justin Fields, and we were just talking about his greatness this year, so it's surprising to say he has to do anything. But this is a top-10 Indiana team, and the fact is, as surprising as it is to say this, the Big Ten's not any good. So there aren't going to be a lot of opportunities for him to get many wins here against teams that sort of have that notoriety. So I'm taking Justin Fields as one that has to have a big game, Christine. All right, Harry, I'm going to ask you this question quickly because we know who the top three guys are. Do you think there's any other guys that could possibly get into that top three area? I'm not going to say no. I think Zach Wilson is obviously a guy that can catapult himself in there. I know there's been a lot of talk about BYU adding another late game that might help them, you know, get into the playoff. And I think that could also help his Heisman status as well. Yeah, I'm doubling down. Same answer, especially I think Oregon and BYU should get it done. Find a way to play. If those two teams can play, that really helps both schools, but it could help Zach Wilson also. Well, we will see what happens. The race is getting even tighter at the top. Thanks for watching the Heisman Show presented by Nissan, the premier partner of the Heisman Trophy. We will see you guys next week, and Fitz will see you literally everywhere. (laughs) Woo!